Are you aware that a pagan king in Babylon received a dream that would reveal the four known global empires for the ensuing 500 years? Additionally, this dream also ties directly into the end of days according to the Bible. Interestingly, when all of the magicians and astrologers in the king's court were unable to decipher this dream, a young Hebrew prophet ordained by God provided heaven's counsel to the royal court. Join us now as we venture into the early stages of the divinely inspired life and steps of the Hebrew disciple and prophet in the 70 weeks of Daniel, interpreting a king's dream. I am Mark Russick, and you are listening to The Russick Outlook. As always, just my opinion. Hello, everyone. So glad you could join us. This is Mark Russick, and you're listening to The Russick Outlook. Today and for the next few broadcasts, we're going to be looking into the book of Daniel, specifically as it relates to the end times. Uh, This section is called the 70 weeks of Daniel interpreting a a king's dream. Why 70 weeks? Well, there's been a preordained slice of time that the Lord showed Daniel that is allotted for in uh, in history uh, that will ultimately culminate in the establishment and the return of Jesus into the establishment of his millennial kingdom on earth. And it's broken down into three sections, 62 weeks of years, seven weeks of years, and one week of years. The 62 weeks of years and the seven weeks of years have already transpired, and, and, and we'll show that and we'll prove that out. And then there's one week of years left, which would be the seven years of tribulation. Obviously, when I say a week of years, I'm referring to uh, the number seven. So, uh, as I said, we're going to concentrate this first half on what's called the interpreting the king's dream. We're going to just give a little bit of an introduction into the book of Daniel. Daniel is a, a, a fascinating character, one whom I, is one of my favorite individuals. Uh, he's, he's a man of courage, of bold faith, of conviction, of tenacity, a man of prayer, uh, and a man of immense wisdom. Um, and, and his book is, is it, you know, so many people know about it and they know the story of Daniel and the lion's den. And some of you may know about the, uh, the three friends of Daniel and the fiery furnace, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But there's a lot of mystery or there's, there's some confusion. And I know a lot of Christians who say, I just can't understand it. You know, I, they, they, they kind of put this in Revelation on the shelf because of the lot of, a lot of the symbols and um, a lot of the things that they just can't wrap their heads around. So I'm going to do my best to show you that it's, you know, with the Holy Spirit, with the Lord's input, that we can come to understand what these things are and expect great things to come. Listen, if you enjoyed subjects like this, and I hope you do, uh, please hit the like or subscribe button. Um, we're trying to get this information out to like-minded people and also people who have questions, who have comments, who have concerns, um, people who may not be Christians, who, who want to know, you know, how can you convince me that, that this Jesus is real? Um, ultimately, I am, and I've said this many times, uh, I'm about the truth. How do I get to the truth? So in these studies, you're going to see that we're going to examine history in the face of, of what was given as prophecy. So things that were written down hundreds and thousands of years earlier by the prophet Daniel actually did come to pass with some specificity that would blow your mind, that defy all human logic and reasoning. So again, if you like this, please hit the like or subscribe button. Uh, and, and I would love if you could jump on the uh, website, if you wouldn't mind just putting your email in. Uh, there's a section there for that. Uh, and all we're doing with that is alerting you to when new podcasts come up, new video blogs, new postings come up. That's all we're doing. We're not, we're not doing anything else with it. So this is part of a, of a series which I'm calling the 70 Weeks of Daniel, the foundation for the coming tribulation. That's the basics of the three. But in order to do that, I'd like to first introduce you a little bit to Daniel, what the book is about. We're going to be concentrating for the most part on the second half of Daniel. But here in this section, we're going to delve a little bit in, in the first half 
because that's where uh, King Nebuchadnezzar's dream is, and that's where there are interpretation to the coming world empires and the end of days. So let me introduce you to Daniel. Uh, a little bit of background, his name means God is my judge. He is likely to be raised in a very well-to-do home, educated in the ways of God. He was among one of the first captives that were taken from Jerusalem in the, in the Babylonian uh, captivity of Israel, or the Babylonian conquest, I should say. So for those who may not know, Babylon uh, conquered Israel in roughly 605 B.C., and this is when um, Daniel and others were, were taken into Mesopotamia. Um, his commitment to God was repeatedly tested in Babylon, as well as his three friends, and I, I mentioned that. He never returned to Jerusalem uh, over the course of his entire life. He learned firsthand about the rise and fall of the world's most powerful kingdoms. Uh, he served in the royal court in Babylon in his, in his final years, and he also served the Persian kings. So he was there uh, for Babylonian captivity and also witnessed the Medo-Persian Empire taking over and wound up serving them. So here you have this Hebrew prophet or man of God at the time um, who is called and is recognized as having gifts and talents and wisdom um, by secular uh, or non-believing kings and people of the royal court for two different empires. Uh, his book is broken down into six different narratives, chapters one through six. Uh, it, it outlines that, and I'll show that in a second. And then there's the, the, the four different visions, which we'll cover in great detail in the two sections following this. That's in chapters seven through 12. So the narrative in chapters one through six, the six narratives are the diet experiment. Um, you, it's just, you can look up Genesis diet uh, or, or the Daniel diet online, and you'll see it's concentration of fruits and vegetables. But please, by all means, you know, read the book and, and the, uh, the wisdom of, of, of eating this over the king's meat. Uh, miraculous interpretation of Nebuchadnezzar's dreams which we will cover very shortly, the three friends in the fiery furnace, how Nebuchadnezzar went crazy when he, he, he went mad, the mysterious handwriting on the wall, which is fascinating uh, because that came to pass as well. And then Daniel and the lion's den, and most people are familiar with that. As far as the visions in the second half of the book that covers the four beasts in chapter seven, the ram and the goat in chapter nine, the prophecy of the 77s in chapter nine. So those three will be covered in section two. And then fourth is the prophecies of Israel's future, and we will cover that in the last section. At the heart of these visions was the movement of earthly kingdoms. Daniel saw the Babylonian kingdom replaced by the Persian and then onto the Greek and eventually the Roman Empire, exactly as history wound up uh, rolling out. The most important vision, however, is the establishment of the kingdom that will never be destroyed. This is a kingdom that will crush all of the previous kingdoms and bring them all to an end, and this one will last forever. Uh, through Daniel, God showed the world that it is the kingdom of his son, the one like the son of man whose kingdom shall have no end. My reference there is Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. Let me give you an overview of the prophecies. Um, Daniel, at a very young age, 18 in 602 BC, he, this is where he uh, interpreted the, the vision of the great statue, which we're shortly going to cover. This covers, the, or the significance, I should say, is the time of the Gentiles. Um, at age 68, some 50 years later, is when he gets uh, the vision for the four pe for the four beasts and the prof and the ancient of days. The significance of this it covers the nations, the antichrist, and the kingdom of God. Um, two years later, it gets the vision of the ram and and the male goat that covers the nations and the antichrist. The seventy sevens covering the Messiah and the tribulation, and then the last two at age eighty five, the future of nations. Uh, which covers all of the nations and the Antichrist and then the future of Israel, which is the tribulation and then the kingdom of heaven here on earth. So in all of this, there are four consistent themes. One is the sovereignty, the sovereignty hand of God over human affairs. 
whether protecting individuals dealing with nations that seek to usurp his position or defeating evil forces set to hinder his purposes, God does his, as he wills. And I give you a whole bunch of scriptures here for that. So all of that to say that, um, you know, we may have not have uh, kings or governments or people in authority that we necessarily want or follow along um, the statutes uh, of the Lord, but the Lord will allow certain things in order to accomplish his objectives. Um, but ultimately, you know, his heart is for you to follow him. Obedience, the nature of faith marks every believer. Consider the fiery furnace, how Daniel refused to bow down to idols, and because of that, he was thrown in the lion's den and then protected in the lion's den. Think of that. Think of how he stood in the face of adversity where he was forced to forced or uh, made to worship a false god. He refused, thrown in the lion's den, and then the Lord supernaturally protects him. There is a sign and wonder right there. Um, and think of the people in the, in the courts and how the word must have gone around that, that God, that the God of Daniel protected him in the lion's den. Um, so the, the, stressing the importance of obedience, and that's why I say, you know, Daniel is such an important figure. Kingdom, Satan empowers all of the kingdoms of this world. 1 John five nineteen. Jesus Christ came into the world to dismantle Satan's kingdom and authority, 1 John 3, 8. But since all true power belongs to God, any human kingdom not submitted to God is in opposition to him. Daniel charts the rise and fall of earthly kingdoms and the establishment of God's eternal kingdom. So, so important. And, and we see this all around the world today. Uh, omniscient primarily demonstrates the divine revelations that Daniel received. God not only knows the grand scope of the future, but also the movements in the kingdoms right down to their very dreams. So jumping now to the interpretation, let me give you a, a, a quick background to this. King Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. He's deeply troubled by it. He doesn't understand it. He goes to the, the, his magistrates of, or, or, or the courts. There's the sooth uh, slayers, the astrologers, the magicians, all the people that he would look to for supernatural interpretation. And he says to them, I want you to tell me what the dream was and what it means. Their reply was, we can't do that. You must tell us what the dream is. And he basically, I'm, you know, I'm giving you my version of it. He says, if you can't figure that out, then you don't deserve to be in your position. And he hands out a death sentence. So the death sentence goes out and Daniel learns about it from one of the uh, king's guards. And he tells the guard, bring me to the king. The Lord will show me and the Lord will interpret the dream and don't allow these people to be, ki to be killed. So he stands in the gap, but what's uh, of, of great interest to me that I notice is he doesn't puff himself up. He says, I've got this. He says, the Lord will interpret the dream. So he's relying, he has faith that if he stands out and, and, and walks out in faith that the Lord will meet him and show him this. So now he's brought to the king. And what happens? He says, you, O king, saw and behold, there was a great image. This image was mighty and exceedingly great. Brightness stood before you and the appearance was frightening and terrible. As for the image, it was the head of fine gold, its breast and arms of silver, its belly and its thighs of bronze, its legs of iron and feet partly of iron and partly of clay. As you looked, a stone was cut without human hands which smote the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in two pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, the gold were broken and crushed together, became like the shape of, of the summer threshing floors, and the wind swept them away. Not a trace of them could be found. So just picture, he sees this great vision uh, of, of these four different elements covering the four different parts of the body, and then this giant stone just crushes it to to dust and then a wind comes in and blows it it's like you you haven't seen it before and and you know you can naturally understand why the king king is troubled by that so he says you o king uh, are the king of uh, to whom god of heaven has given the king the kingdom the power the might and the glory and wherever the children of men dwell and the beasts of the field and the birds of the heavens he has given them into your hands and has made you to rule over all of them so right there he's telling them you have your position because the Lord has allowed this. 
And then he begins to interpret it. He said, uh, you, O king, Babylon, are the head of gold. And after you shall arise another kingdom inferior, inferior to you, and still a third kingdom of bronze, which shall bear rule over the earth, and the fourth kingdom, uh, which shall be as strong as iron, and iron breaks to pieces and subdues things, and like iron which crushes, it shall break and crush all of these. And as you saw the feet and the toes, partly of clay and partly of iron, it shall be a divided kingdom. There shall be in it some firmness and strength, which is iron, and then iron mixed with clay, not so strong. And as the toes of the feet were partly of iron and partly of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly brittle. And as you saw the iron mixed with mirthy and earth and clay, so shall they mingle themselves in the seed of men, uh, but they will not hold together, even as iron does not hold with clay. And in the days of these kings, these ten kings, the ten toes, shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, nor shall its sovereignty be left to another place. And he goes on to say, in closing, that the dream is certain and the interpretation of it is true. So you can take it to the bank, king. So I'd like to kind of break this down a little bit. So the central image in the dream was a great statue. It had a head of gold, chest, arms of silver, a midsection of bronze, legs of iron, and feet of iron mixed with clay. If you're watching this on video, you can see an artist's interpretation of what this may have looked like. Um, this is considered the, the, the time of the Gentiles. The second image in the dream was a finely crafted stone that struck the feet of the statue, blasting the entire statue to bits and replacing it and growing it into a great mountain that fills the whole earth. Daniel explains that the metallic image in the dream represents four successive Gentile world powers that will rule over Israel in the years ahead. So these are four um, dominant global empires, but Israel is part of their conquest. That a representative of the nation of Israel succeeded in interpreting the dream, and the representatives of Babylon, the most powerful nation of the day, that the destiny of the nations depends on Israel's God and the fulfillment of God's purpose for Israel. One Gentile kingdom would follow another, but the final and the everlasting kingdom would be promised to Israel by their God. So let me break this down a little bit. The head of gold, Nebuchadnezzar would have certainly understood this. He had gold throughout the city. His chief deity, Marduk, was known as the god of gold. Additionally, gold had been de deposited um, throughout the walls, the palaces, um, and, and when they did a lot of archaeological digs, they, they saw remnants of this. They saw, and, and they saw a lot of historical writings of this outside of the Bible about the gold in the city. The silver, the silver arms merging into a test, chest indicates an empire composed of two nations. They call it a dual mar monarchy. Although this chapter does not present enough information to determine the empire, other chapters make it very clear this is the Medo-Persian Empire, which conquered Babylon on October 11th and 12th in 50, 539 BC. We know this from Daniel 531. The Medes and the Persians had united in 550 BC, and the text of Daniel states that Babylon was given over to the, to the Medes and the Persians. Daniel 8.20 identifies a ram with two horns. We'll cover that in the next section. These are the kings of Media and Persia. This is a single nation divided by two authorities. Um, and, and, you know, again, we're going to go into this more uh, afterwards, but this represents the Medes and the Persians, which was called um, the Mede-Persian Empire. The third section uh, which is thighs of bronze, was predicted to rule over the earth, according to Daniel 2.39. The Greek empire was begun by Philip of Macedon and extended by his son Alexander to the farthest reaches of the known world. Obviously, we're talking about Alexander the Great. Bronze was a symbol of Greece, partly because their soldiers were dressed in bronze armor. They had more territory than the Babylonian or Persian empires. They later being conquered, uh, in, in, I'm sorry, the latter being conquered in 331 BC. However, just as Daniel predicted, Alexander's four generals divided up his empire after his death. 
Only two of them affected dominance over Israel. Uh, and this was based in, in um, the Ptolemies, based in Egypt and the uh, Seleucids, or based in Syria. Uh, this fits well with Daniel's division of the statue's massive midsection, which is divided into two thighs. Uh, the Seleucid ruler Antiochus IV of Epiphanes imposed Greek culture on the Jews and desecrated the Second Temple. Uh, which was predicted by Daniel in chapter 11, the Greeks extensively used bronze for all of their weapons of war. Finally, the two iron legs uh, with feet were composed of a mixture of iron and pottery, and that would crush opponent kingdoms and divide up their former territories. Iron, which is stronger than gold, silver, or bronze, was the metal developed for the weaponry of Rome, which conquered all of the lands of the previous kingdoms and assimilated into one vast empire. Rome defeated Greece in 146 BC and occupied the land in, of Israel in 63 BC. This ended all Jewish independence. Rome destroyed the Jewish temple in 70 AD, which was predicted by Jesus, and by 395 AD had split this into two political geographic areas. You had a western capital in Rome and an eastern capital in Constantinople, which would be modern-day Istanbul, uh, and this included Israel. Uh, this is depicted in the statue's two legs. So there you have the interpretation of the dream. You have uh, how we can easily relate to those coming empires that, that followed the bat, started with the Babylonians and then followed. What's so interesting, we're going to find out in the next section how this directly correlates to visions that, that Daniel was given, and we're going to start off that with what he's given in chapter 7 and then later in, in chapter 8 as well as uh, some other things. So um, I hope you enjoyed this. This is just the beginning. I'm trying to break this into sections to give you pieces at a time, get your head wrapped around it, because like I said, there are people who find the book of Daniel challenging, um, and, and ultimately, you know, we're trying to get this information broken down so we can understand it. Uh, I, I encourage you, if you can, to watch the video. There are some slides on there and some, uh, some renderings that I think visually will help you understand this and, and put this information together so uh, it makes sense. At, at least that's the feedback that I've been given. I, I do these studies in Bible studies, and uh, the, the people that um, I, I, I work with, they, they're dear, dear friends, and, you know, I, and I encourage them to give me feedback, and they tell me that these visuals absolutely uh, solidify their understanding. So thank you again for your time. I really appreciate it. Um, if you could, hit a like or subscribe if you do like it. And if you don't, that's okay too. You can let me know. Uh, this information is out there. It's available for everyone. If you have any questions, comments, please email me at russicoutlook at gmail.com as well as prayer requests. If you have any prayer requests or if if you're not sure where you are with the Lord, it's, it's a very simple thing to do. Just ask him into your heart and, and he'll meet you there. Uh, so this is Mark Russick. Uh, you've been listening to the Russick Outlook. And remember, as always, just my opinion.